c'est putain. Ouais, on a vraiment les, les trucs dans les yeux. C'est atroce, hein. C'est des tortures. On ne peut pas les enlever. C'est des tortures à cet moment, mais c'est. Oui, oui. <rire> Moi, je vais avoir du mal à, à, à parler. Hein, euh... Euh, c'est ça. On fait deux sessions, on fait une session qui est plus les débats publics sur le domaine général, donc ça ce sera euh, Annie, euh, Lucien et Lucas Belli. La deuxième session, régulation, action, donc ça c'est euh, Chérif Diallo, voilà, Chérif Diallo, toi et euh, Francesca Cabria. Ok. Parce que c'est après chaque session qu'on fera les questions. Uh, good morning everyone. Uh, so I, su I suggest we, we begin uh, now so we can uh, finish on time. Um, well, um, uh, 
very uh, glad to uh, have this uh, session uh, about uh, public interest data uh, in uh, the Internet Governance Forum. So uh, I am a uh, Laurent uh, Seitemann. Uh, I am a, a judge, administrative judge uh, in France uh, in the Council of State, and I uh, have worked uh, on the subject of uh, public interest data, uh, and I will moderate this debate. So I will make a, a very short uh, introduction. Um, uh, what are we talking about, public interest data? Um, well, uh, it's, uh, most of us are very familiar with the notion of open data because there has been a lot of discussion uh, since uh, 10 years about open data. Uh, open data is usually public data, data owned by the state, by cities. But um, in the last few years, uh, the, the awareness that some private data, data owned by companies, by NGOs, uh, uh, there can also be some public interest, some general interest to uh, share it. Um, for various uh, public interest goals, to promote uh, public health, to uh, protect the environment, uh, to uh, foster competition, uh, innovation. So uh, that's what we will discuss today. Uh, I give just two example, examples to introduce the, se the session. Uh, first example, it's uh, something called uh, open food facts. Maybe some of you have heard about it. It's uh, just a, a group of uh, benevolent uh, citizens who have uh, started to uh, um, track uh, what uh, the ingredients of food, of any product. So they have made a huge database of uh, what's in the food. Uh, and uh, so it helps any uh, citizen, any consumer, to uh, know what is healthy uh, to eat. And uh, some very successful apps have been uh, uh, devised using this uh, database, like uh, Yuka. Uh, so first example. Another example is uh, mobile phone data, which is uh, more and more uh, uh, used by uh, the uh, operators to uh, uh, give some insights about how the people move. And it's very interesting for many, many actors, like the cities, and some uh, mobile phone operators sell this data uh, to help, uh, for example, the cities make some urban planning. So with these two examples, we have uh, a first idea about the potential, uh, the public interest potential of this private data, and also, uh, we see that there are various models about data sharing. The first one is a non-profit, uh, no-cost uh, data sharing. Uh, the second one is um, uh, it's uh, for-profit uh, selling this data. So uh, we will have these questions to discuss. Uh, uh, what is the potential of uh, public uh, interest uh, data sharing? Uh, which regulation, which economic model, which safeguards for uh, data protection? So we discuss this. We, uh, in order to let you, uh, the public, have uh, some time to uh, ask us uh, questions, uh, which is always uh, uh, the most interesting part, uh, we have, we'll have two sessions. The first session, uh, is about um, uh, the public debate about uh, this subject. So we will have first um, Annie Blondin, which is a member of uh, who is a member of the French Digital Council, uh, who will uh, talk about uh, environmental data. Lucien Castex from uh, Internet Society France, uh, who will talk about uh, the issues uh, of uh, about uh, AI, artificial intelligence, and uh, Luca Belli, who has just joined us. Uh, hi, Luca. Uh, who will talk about uh, the articulation between open data and uh, public interest data sharing. So, anyone will have, any of you will have nine minutes, not ten, and uh, I will be very strict. And then you will have ten minutes to ask questions about this first session. And then we move to the second session, which will be about uh, regulation action, how do we act uh, about this uh, subject, and we'll have uh, two presentations by um, communications regulators, 
in Senegal by uh, Mr. Diallo and in France uh, by uh, Sebastian Soriano. Uh, and uh, last but not least, uh, Francesca Bria, uh, who is uh, the CTO of uh, the city of Barcelona and who will uh, tell us about uh, what they are doing uh, in Barcelona. Uh, okay, uh, thanks a lot, and uh, I, I give the floor to uh, Annie Blondin. Thank you, Laurent Sitterman, for this introduction of the panel. Um, I am very honored to have the opportunity to speak about our action as a French Digital Council on environment and digital. Um, the French Digital Council is an independent advisory commission appointed by the French Digital Ministry, and so we help the French government elaborate, shape, and implement digital public policies. So this council created a special working group on digitalization and environment, and the three uh, pillars are to create a um, national and European roadmap for an ecological digital at the service of the sustainable development goals, uh, a French position uh, on artificial intelligence and um, digital, and a doctrine on the concept of data of general interest applied to environment data. So this presentation does, does not deal with opening of public data, but with opening of private data. Environment data are crucial, and they can be put at the service of the ecological transition. They are support to public decision making, innovative solutions for enterprises, citizen empowerment. But to fight against climate change, we need structural changes, and digitalization only offers the opportunity to optimize uh, the change. Keep in mind that we have never had so, so well qualified the role of humans in global warming without accelerating the adoption of the relevant measures. So now a few words about the work of the French Digital Council on environmental data. So these data have a natural vocation to be described as data of general interest. First, it is important to define environmental data, their production, the legal framework, before envisaging scenarios in order to build a real concept of environmental data of general interest. So we find the definitions in different legal instruments that provide for opening of public data according to the Arus Convention or the French Environmental Code. There are different categories of environmental information. The state, of the element of environment, such uh, air, water, landscape, everything that affects these elements, and also the states of human health activities and measures. Thus, environmental data have a transversal character. The general interest approach calls for a more larger definition. Most of the data on health and agriculture are no part of this definition, as well as data that can become environmental data, even if they are collected for another purpose, in particular data concerning mobility. So this definition uh, includes state and flows, and also real-time flows. It clearly appears that environmental data are linked to a specific territory, and that they have an infrastructural signification. On the other hand, the environmental data can be personal data in certain cases. Uh, these data are produced by different actors, associations, companies, citizens. For instance, in France, a large amount of data on biodiversity are collected by naturalist associations. Then they can also be co-produced, and they will more, be more and more captured by machines. So there is a large variety of data, from raw data to value-added data, even, even if data are not supposed to speak for themselves. Concerning the legal regime, there are different legal bases for this data, from collection to sharing, law, contracts, litigation, indeed, 
and environmental data can benefit from different uh, legal protections. So what about the scenarios um, concerning this data? The general interest is at the heart of the legal status of environmental data. The general interest looks like an evidence. This, that's the reason why the Aarhus Convention provides the rights of everyone to receive environmental data that is held by public authorities, and uh, it provides the right to participate in environmental decision making. So these data have a natural vocation to be qualified as data of general interest and to be accessible. This stems for their, uh, the, from their availability in the nature, uh, we pick them, and from the different uses they allow. At the international level, certain uh, data are, in a sense, a common heritage of humanity. This is the case of the seabed, the moon, on, and other celestial bodies. At the French level, according to our environmental charter, which has a constitutional value, environment is a common good for human beings. Does this mean that environmental data must be considers, considered as commons. Uh, this is not so easy. We need to conciliate the public interest served by disclosure or opening of data and the private or commercial interest served by the refusal to disclose. Sharing from private actors to government raises less concern than data sharing among economic actors. Concerning the first case, the French uh, bill uh, for digital republic is very innovative insofar it provides an obligation to publish data for some private companies and in some certain cases. But general interest does not automatically mean opening. On the contrary, it may mean more control over the data. Speaking about general interest should not make us forget that the data are at the heart of competition and geopolitical issues. We identify a risk of appropriation or reappropriation of environmental data by the digital gi giants, mainly uh, Chinese and American, we are, which are, for example, partnering with large tradition, traditional agricultural groups or supporting startups with aggressive commercial offers. For example, in the agricultural field, Alibaba has partnered with Bayon, agrochemist, to develop a blockchain-based traceability system for agricultural products. So the general interest can order more control over the data. For example, some naturalistic data are, are considered as being sensitive and need to be blocked in order to protect, for example, end endangered species. Some data are even considered as being sovereign. This is the case of the so-called geographic data. Um, this data uh, guide decision-making of the public authorities, and these authorities must not depend on anyone for their availability. Here, the localization issue is very uh, important. That's why several scenarios can be established for data of general env environmental interest. There is the yeah, legislative... So, uh, you, you have I have just, just three you, words. Yeah. First, the, the legislative approach for the sharing of data from companies to the government. This could be an extension of the provisions relating to the digital republic. Sectoral laws should be part of a global framework that defines procedural and substantive conditions. Second, there is the contractual approach, especially for business-to-business -business data sharing. This can be a non-binding approach. Uh, or a binding one on the basis of competition law. And so, this is my last, last word, there is um, a project-based approach, and uh, in this uh, case, uh, the public actors would ask to share data of private, private actors for a specific purpose of general interest. For example, the fight against the erosion of biodiversity. And 
the judge has a role to play concerning um, uh, the access to studies on the impact of glyphosate on health. Uh, very recently, the General Court of the U European Union considered that the question, that the public <coughs> interest is more important than the protection of the commercial interest of the companies in question, since the public interest is even presumed concerned emissions uh, in, the, in the environment. So to conclude, we need, an, to, first of all, to understand practices in order to build a position on this type of data of general inter interest. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Annie, for the words. Uh, and for giving the good example for timekeeping. So uh, I, I give the mic to uh, Lucien. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, well, I try to be uh, on time also. Um, well, public interest data, basically, I'll, I'll try to go through two points. First, uh, producing data, and obviously, it's important as it concerns artificial intelligence and emerging technologies. And two, what uh, issues can we spot on uh, legal? and ethical concerns. Uh, what, what can we discuss following what Annie uh, just said? So first, um, on the production of data. Well, um, if you want to, to foster a data-driven decision-making, basically, you need more data. And you need to be able to, basically, to, to, to work with it. You need to be able to access it. You need to be able to enrich it. And two of the major points are the quality of data, basically, um, and that such data uh, need to be up to date. Uh, it's particularly concerning uh, when you use the data with big machine learning algorithm, because, well, if the data is not up to date, basically, uh, you might have a wrong decision made of that data. And Obviously, also, there is a large variety of data. First, granularity. Uh, when you analyze data, what granularity do you want? At which point? Um, so analysis is begging the question, uh, what to do with co-produced data? What to do when the data is combined? And then, what to do about the sharing? If somebody is uploading content for example, on social media, is doing research over some search engine. Well, the data is enriched by uh, every new search. So you need to be able to basically to exploit it. You need to be able also to, to control it, to, to have some transparency of it. As you, you heard, as Annie presented quickly, we had in France a French act in 2016 for a digital republic, uh, which allows government to request commercial actors to give access to the data for statistic purposes. And the, the law uh, is asking, uh, well, you need impact studies to, to know what kind of data you might use. Then you need transparency about such impact studies. Also, and this is a main issue, should you extend such access to other kind of data? For example, uh, what about research? You need to be able to, for example, for public funded research to access data so that you can control, you can understand how it's working, and if you are based on machine learning algorithm, like I mentioned earlier, well, you need to access the data to be able to understand how the data is used in such algorithms. So public research um, might need such access to be able to control and to uh, basically uh, do research studies and impact studies. Also, and back to artificial intelligence, if you train algorithms, well, algorithms obviously as a need of data. And if you don't have such data, you can train algorithms. And you are back on the quality of the data. If the data is of poor quality, if the data is not updated, well, you're lacking behind in terms of artificial intelligence. And 
basically, it has a direct commercial impact. And, well, um, it might be also a good idea to have such data made available so new actors can come in the market and, well, train algorithms and develop new services and enter competition. Still, you need a, well, you need a coherent framework and, and that's my main point on the legal issue, you need a, a transversal framework. Uh, we can work at the French level, we have a number of legislation, Laurent, uh, and Annie presented a few of them. We have obviously data on the free flow of personal data or non-personal data. We have the GDPR, we have the French law and a number of other legislation and provisions. But, well, basically we need a transversal approach throughout the European Union and basically uh, allowing a common approach about data. Um, also in France, we have a national AI strategy, including the need to share data sets um, for public authorities. But when you have data saving the public interest, healthcare, AI, as you say, any environmental protection, well, you need a wider data set possible to boost competition, and you are stuck with a problem of sensitive data. If you consider sensitive data and personal data, well, you are obviously considering IoT, so Internet of Things. Can you um, use the data of objects to, for example, improve healthcare? Uh, is a practitioner uh, allowed to use such data to improve how uh, an hospital will treat a patient? And is the data available and to whom? So that's a, a, a main issue. Uh, as you presented uh, Laurent, I'm with the Internet Society in France and also with the French Human Rights Commission. And, well, that's the main issue of artificial intelligence. We just started to work of the human rights impact of artificial intelligence. And that's clearly the main limit. What can you do with the data? How to make it transparent so that every actor can use it and enter the competition? Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Now for the last uh, intervention about uh, these uh, debates going on about uh, data sharing for public interest. Uh, Luca. Okay, it's already working. Good morning to everyone, and I apologize for the delay. I was in another session that uh, ended with some delay, so I had to run here. So please excuse me if I was the last one arriving. Uh, my name is Luca Belli. I am professor of internet governance and regulation at FGV Law School in uh, Rio de Janeiro. And uh, well, the, my point basically today is that in order to uh, regulate or understand the kind of value uh, and the kind of mindset we need to utilize private uh, data for the public interest, we should learn from the experiences that we already have uh, to avoid making the same mistakes and try to have a strategy. Because all, as almost everything in life, if you have a strategy uh, and if you study what happened before, you maximize the chances of success. So uh, I think, first of all, what is uh, important to, to, to stress is that the fact that private data exist does not mean that they automatically will generate value. Of course, they are extremely important because they may help solving a lot of problems, mainly for statistical purposes, mainly in developing countries where official public statistics are uh, maybe lacking or incomplete or of low quality, so integrating them with private data is extremely meaningful, can uh, allow us to understand a lot about our lives, our environments, our societies, our economies, and therefore they have a huge potential. But on the other hand, data, they are not inherently valuable. They are only valuable once they are processed and once one designs the way to process in them that uh, produces value and generate, generate insights. So the fact, the mere data, the raw data themselves, 
have, are not so valuable. What is valuable is the uh, inferences, the knowledge that one is able to extract from them. The second point that I would like to uh, stress is that a lot of what we are uh, trying to to understand now about private data and how they could be utilized for, private, for, for public interest already resonates with the open data movement uh, that try to understand how publicly uh, generated data could be used to generate value, could be opened uh, for general public to uh, utilize them to, to for other purposes. Uh, now, this again, uh, opening public data does not mean that they automatically generate value as some were arguing uh, like a decade ago. We have seen that they only generate value when people and the data processor has a good strategy to make them generate value. Uh, what is interesting also for, from the open data movement is that the, how open data have been defined help us a lot to understand how private data should be considered and should be framed in order to uh, be useful for the private interest. Uh, open data are usually the public data that are uh, released in a digital format, structured in, structured in an open format, available online, uh, released with open licenses so that people can make the wider use they can, a free use of the data. Now, all these elements are easier to uh, implement with publicly uh, organized, produced, held data, much more complicated to implement with private data, especially when we still lack regulation on how to do it. And uh, the, here are some challenges that I would like to stress. Uh, first of all, private data, as the adjective suggests, are private not open public and they're ready to be open. So they have to, uh, the, the, the private corporations that uh, collect and generate them may be reluctant to share them. So unless there is specific regulation and policies uh, require them to share them, they will not share them because they may reveal sensitive information to competitors, which is a very uh, uh, legitimate uh, reason not to reveal data. And on the other hand, opening private data represents a cost, uh, a cost on different levels. First of all, you have to, to respect uh, existing regulation. A lot of private data are intimately intertwined with personal data and uh, a, a private corporation sharing personal data uh, previously collected for non-specified purposes with the government may raise a lot of alerts in the mind of everyone who cares for data protection and privacy. So the, a, a shortcut to this uh, would be either having law that specifically define the purposes for which those data should be shared and how, which uh, would comply with many of the re existing regulation on, on, on data protection. The other shortcut is anonymized data. Uh, for instance, in the new, newly approved uh, general data protection regulation, sorry, general data protection law in Brazil that will enter in force next year, Article 12 explicitly states that if data are anonymized, they could be utilized. They are not personal data. They could be utilized free freely. The problem, of course, is that anonymization has a cost. Uh, and there are very few, uh, there are already some corporations like IBM, Microsoft experimenting homomorphic encryption that allows to uh, process data, anonymizing them, but th th those techniques are again very costly and only few actors have them and this represents a cost. A, uh, a further cost may be the fact that uh, all data that are, uh, that are uh, collected are not usually uh, collected and structured in an interoperable format. Uh, if you don't have interoperability, it's highly difficult to share data. And again, this can be easily solved by defining what are the, the, the standards for interoperability. But since those are not defined, a corporation would have to guess which uh, format will, would have to adopt. Again, taking the Brazilian case as an example, uh, these interoperability standards will probably be defined by the upcoming data protection regulator that according to Article 40 of the new uh, law will have the possibility to define interoperability standards to allow data portability, uh, which is new, a new right under Article 18 of the law. But that is something hypothetical so far. So to have this concretely 
it is necessary to have strategies, policies, and regulations that define how to overcome these obstacles. Now, a very, uh, two, I don't know how much time I still have, uh, but I will... Two, two minutes. Two minutes. So I will wrap up providing a, a good example of how, of how this could work in practice. Uh, there was a partnership uh, designed by the Rio de Janeiro uh, municipal government in 2013 uh, with uh, Waze, the application provider, uh, the partnership wa was designed by my colleague at FGV, Pablo Sardeja, that was the previous uh, chief data officer at the uh, municipal government. And uh, it was very successful because it, allows, it allowed ways to share uh, data on traffic with the municipal government, and therefore the municipal government could plan, uh, you could develop urban planning considering real-time data and therefore being much more efficient in targeting traffic, reducing uh, carbon emission, and enhancing uh, people's quality of life. So this is a very good example of this could work in practice uh, on one hand, and the partnership was replicated in many cities. Uh, first it was uh, labeled uh, connected uh, citizens, and now it uh, has been relabeled as ways for cities, if I'm not mistaken. And, uh, but the, so these are the, the, the benefits. On the other hand, uh, we, if we look at this specific case, we also can have some uh, red flags uh, popping up because this partnership was defined in total lack of data protection uh, regulation. So in 2013, Brazil did not have a data protection uh, law. Uh, and even the Marco Civil, the general uh, uh, framework for, for internet rights, was not yet approved at the time. So that partnership was designed in total lack of any data protection guidance, which may be something happening also in other places in the world. So again, to, to wrap up and to conclude, I think that there is an incredible potential in this, but to, as any other thing, I think, uh, in, with regard to technology, one has to have vision and a strategy. And then, if necessary, regulate or co-regulate in, in the way in which the interaction between the private sector and the public sector maximizes the benefits for the people and reduces also the cost for the private sector. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Luca. I think uh, with uh, these three interventions, we already have uh, Lots of food for uh, thought and uh, discussion. So uh, feel free to raise your hand. Uh, I will take a, a few questions bit before uh, letting uh, the speakers answer. Yes? Uh, okay. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Can I be heard? Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Good. So, thanks for the interventions. Uh, my question is particularly to you, but anyone feel free to contribute. So, <laughs> so, microphone is on. Okay. Should I continue from here? As you like. <laughs> okay. Surprise us. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, yeah, you hear me now? <laughs> Thank you. So just continue with all these different categories of data that you're presenting to us, which was very learning. It was very nice. I would like to ask you, uh, on the open data ecosystem, and we, when we're talking about uh, the personal data that's also being part of this context of open data, in particular the ones that are held by the public sector. My question is, uh, in your opinion, shouldn't we also consider uh, not only the what and how, but also the who? I mean, who is going to access and process this data because, I mean, it's very interesting and very important, but also, uh, what exactly, for example, law enforcement authorities will be using this data for? Shouldn't this be transparent? And well, this is quite a rhetorical question, but I would like to hear from you 
yeah, some enlightenments on that. Okay, thanks a lot. Other questions? Yes? So there is a mic uh, walking uh, in this part of the room, and this one maybe also. Oh, yeah, uh, Veronica from Algorithm Watch. Uh, two quick questions. One's around anonymization. Um, it's been shown over and over again that it is relatively easy to re engineer, reverse engineer anonymization. So, how do we deal with that? And the second larger point is how do we deal with private companies using public or open data and gaining a profit from it? What kind of licensing? Uh, can we put in place that private companies don't profit from our data? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Maybe we take these uh, three first questions. So, who would like to answer? About yeah, Luca. The first question. Uh, well, it's not really rhetorical. It uh, it be a public or a private corporation. Sorry, private corporation. Sorry, or public organ, public body analyzing, collecting, processing data they will still have obligations. So under almost any uh, data protection framework in the world, and there are more than 130 countries now having data protection frameworks, uh, they usually apply to both private and public sectors. So the fact that you uh, use uh, data originated by private corporations and repurpose if you want, uh, does not uh, entail a waiver on the responsibilities of the data controllers, the data uh, uh, the, in all the uh, elements of the data protection ecosystem. In many countries, there, is, there will be also a data protection officer. Uh, for instance, in Brazil, it will be uh, mandatory for everyone uh, collecting data and making use of data, which uh, is a way to make sure that a country that has not had a data protection culture like in Europe, where data protection regulation is something that happened since uh, more, more than 20 years, will be able to cope with the increasing complexity of handling very sensitive information, uh, avoiding risks. Uh, and uh, to answer to the other uh, question, uh, I think that I'm not sure uh, it's the uh, approach I would suggest to license public uh, open data in a way in which the private sector cannot make profit because the, it, the, the goal is not avoid that private sector generate profits. The goal is uh, avoid any risks for people. So the fact that one generates profit for with, with its own private uh, activity is not something illegal. What is illegal is to undermine the protections established by law. Uh, so what, again, all this is quite simple to say. It's uh, prescribed by law. Also, the fact that anonymization is an exception and means that you will not have to respect the law is prescribed by the law. I'm not saying it's smart. I personally say it. I think it's quite uh, an oversimplification to state that anonymization will allow you to be free from any constraint because it is almost uh, universally proven that uh, no anonymization technique will not be uh, uh, reversely engineered or uh, proven wrong in uh, a, a minimal uh, lapse of time. So yes, there are a lot, and that is the, exactly the reason why I think that a strategy to cope with these examples in the long term is necessary. Because what the, the knowledge we have now in scientifically speaking or juridically speaking will may be outdated in a couple of years and we cannot uh, renew things every year, legally speaking. Therefore, it is necessary to have long-term vision and to have people that understand what they are doing and they will sustainably cope with these challenges. Sorry if I spoke too much, I speak too much. Okay, thanks, but you answered the three questions uh, uh, in, one, in one answer, so that's great. Uh, <coughs> Yes, next questions uh, in, the, Sorry? in the back. Oh. Yes? Um, on the left. On the Hi. left, sorry. Hi. And then uh, in the back of the room, okay. Hi, uh, actually, I really don't understand why not earning, uh, making uh, money out of uh, public data, so I don't understand why it's not only illegal to use open data to make profit, but it's, I think it's one of the ideas of using open data. And uh, because if people earn money, they can pay taxes. So that's what I wanted to say to the first part. But okay. also, um, 
There's this Indian saying that uh, how to eat an elephant uh, piece by piece. So I think we all know that already on a national level it's quite difficult to organize this big field of open data and interest, uh, open interest data. And so therefore I should think that if we want to organize this on an international or global level we have to think organize, I think, and organize modular, meaning that we have privately produced, commercially produced, and publicly produced data, and we have the producing, the sharing, and the enabling uh, of the use of the data. And we all know that in the past, the <clears throat> open data, which was free, it was misused by companies uh, or uh, people with a lot of money to make even more uh, profit and because we forgot to enable the people to use open data. So it has to be in the beginning that we make sure that using open data and enabling everybody to use open data is essential for the next uh, level of using open data as a global society. But also when we go to the sharing part, I mean in Germany we have uh, competition laws, it's not only privacy laws, it's also trying to regulate the whole thing with competition laws. And we have to maybe start acting in a modular way to organize and ask the question what kind of data are we want to free? Because if we leave that to the lawyers, I think we will still fight in 10 years uh, about freeing data. So um, for me, a working group which thinks of a modular way to organize the whole thing should be something coming out of uh, a session like this. Okay, thanks a lot for this. Uh, it was more a proposition than a question, but it's uh, quite interesting. Uh, going shall, step we, shall we do it like this? Question? <laughs> okay. Uh, next question. Yeah. I try to be more uh, short on my question. My question is basically how to separate between public data and private data, or to frame it differently, how much data is enough data, and where does private data ends and public data begins. And the sub-dimension on this question is potentially who owns that data, because, I mean, every data can be used for public information or public use. My GPS coordinates could be used to uh, improve transport systems, but it could also be misused to track where I'm staying at the moment and potentially arrest me for different reasons or whatever. So my question, how much data is enough data and how to be sure that it's not misused? Thanks. Okay, very important question. Who wants to answer it? Well, uh, maybe I just say a few words about, about this one. Uh, I think, uh, of course, uh, data is uh, versatile uh, uh, because it can be uh, moved easily and uh, so it can be reused for a different purpose. But, uh, well, now there is this notion of public data because, uh, at least in Europe, public authorities are under obligations to open the data. So uh, this is public data. but. Uh, other uh, entities, pri private companies, uh, don't have the same kind of obligations, and that's what we are discussing about. There's a, that's uh, where the limit is. So, um, you, you want to add something, Annie? Yeah, and then we move to the second session. Sometimes it's, you, you're right, it's not so easy to distinguish between private, uh, private uh, production of data and, and public. And, um, uh, and uh, I would like to say uh, that the way the, the data are produced is very important. And um, uh, if, uh, if the citizen participates a lot, so the data must be more open. And uh, when also when um, giant enterprises ap appropriate uh, uh, the data, they must be more open. The, it's a very important key issue. Okay, Lucien, just a few words. Yeah, just a quick one. Um, well, answer <laughs> transparency, the need for transparency. And well, we are the idea, so, well, it could be multi stakeholder so that we can control how it's used and produced. Yeah. Okay. Okay, thanks a lot. So we move to the next uh, session. And uh, before um, 
leaving the floor to uh, Mr. Diallo. I just uh, would uh, like to thank, because I forgot to do this uh, first, uh, Marilou Leroy, who, who is not uh, one of the speakers, who, but who has uh, engineered the panel. And uh, so that's uh, because of her that we are here today. So thanks uh, for her. And uh, Mr. Diallo, so now we move to uh, the questions of uh, how the regulation is implemented in, in the field of uh, communications, by example, how it uses data to deliver better regulation. Uh, and uh, so, uh, okay. you can talk. Thank you. It's working. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Serif uh, Diallo. I am professor of computer science from the University of Gaston Berger, Saint Louis, Senegal. My speech will focus on public interest data uh, in the situation of uh, Senegal country. Uh, to introduce my speech, uh, in Senegal in mid 2017, a cooperation was launched between uh, the National Agency for Demography and Statistics and mobile operator uh, Senatel. Algorithm ran through Senatel's file uh, to retrieve data on tribal subscribers, for example, uh, whose name have been replaced by a pseudonym. It's an anonymization. Once aggregated, this information makes it possible to better identify the needs of the population. Uh, so we can evaluate uh, journal time to reach a rural market and deduce the public transport to implement. Uh, this project called uh, OPAL, Open Algorithm for Better Decision, was supported by the French Development Agency, the World Bank, and Global Partnership for Sustainable Development Data. It is a network of uh, 320 partners from uh, government, private companies, universities, we seem to promote the use of data for public good. So, uh, public interest data in Senegal for what? Data collected by the private sector will help predicting epidemic spreading, mosquito-borne pandemic, remote propagation, movements of people in riot situation. Uh, sharing data can also save lives from information sold by a mobile operator. For example, it would be possible to improve uh, road safety. Sharing of medical analysis data could also help better refine research into genetic or non-genetic factor for the manifestation of certain disease. Need the, so the need to define and regulate uh, the modalities of data sharing is uh, an opportunity for Senegal now. But we have to do this in two ways, uh, in technically ways and uh, legally ways. Technically, there are uh, several ways uh, to share data while respecting their confidentiality. The software approach and the hardware approach. In software approach, we can use uh, some techniques as homomorphic encryption, which make it possible to perform calculation from encrypt data. And the hardware approach with the creation of specific memory zone <laughs> encrypt on the processor. So legally, on the on the other hand, uh, legally, the sharing of personal data could be based on the right to portability. This right to portability could pursue a citizen objective and also an economic one. In uh, Senegal, what is the state, actually, uh, of uh, public interest data? In Senegal, there is no legal framework on domain of public interest data. Uh, consequently, it is an uh, unregulated domain and the personal data protection law uh, framework is too restrictive uh, to uh, help uh, uh, emerging solution from, uh, uh, from uh, public interest data. This may hinder the sharing of public interest data, although there are current important research projects that require the opening provision and sharing of uh, public interest data. So, uh, there are uh, some implementation uh, challenges. 
uh, they remain, in fact, to define standard for interoperability data actions. We must let players agree sector by sector or in a, a, a transversal uh, approach uh, to, uh, on these platforms that allow portability, but also the sale of data between organizations. Uh, several certain scenarios uh, could be uh, implemented, uh, including one called citizen portability. Citizen could auto authorize the portability of their data to the benefit of mission of public interest. This could be facilitated by the establishment of an appropriate legate from firm, legal fr uh, framework. To continue in implementation uh, challenges, uh, update the legal framework taking into account the specific related to public interest data is an important point. And so we could also take into account uh, the link uh, and dependencies with other ICT law uh, and then uh, relax the personal data protection law by including the open and sharing data and making available of public interest data. Uh, in other point, we must also take into account uh, the need of resource for the accompaniment of uh, public uh, policies. And then we should also establish a regulatory framework, a trust framework for public interest data. This is uh, some ideas I would like to serve with you this morning. Thank you very much for your attention. Thanks a lot, uh, Professor Diallo, for this uh, very interesting and concrete uh, presentation. So uh, now um, uh, I give the, the, the mic to uh, Sebastian Soriano, who will talk about uh, data regulation by data in, uh, in France. Yes, thank you very much. I'm, I'm happy to be, to be here. Hello, everybody. And thank you for still being there for the most, um, um, sorry, um, I'm a regulator, so I know it's, it's, it's quite boring to hear regulators, so thank you for being there. <laughs> That's the hard part after it will be easy. Yeah, actually, um, what we are trying to do with data as a regulator, it can be seen as a use case of uh, uh, using data for public interest. We, as regulators, we are in contact with companies that are um, gathering data. So in the telecom sector, as uh, Laurent uh, introduced, telecom companies are gathering data about the geolocalization of people, uh, for instance. And the question is, at what extent can we use our mandatory regime, our regulation, to extract data from this company to public this data or to impose obligation of sharing this, this data. So this is basically the, the, the question. So we have done a, a, a work with eight French regulators. So, sorry, all are French. Uh, but we have been working with, in very different sectors. So financial sector, energy sector, transport sector, telecom sector, audiovisual sector, competition, privacy, and sorry for the eight, uh, I, I'm forgetting. And so we have, uh, we have defined a common approach about how we can use data as a regulator. So we call this regulating with data. So first, regulating with data is different from a simple transparency. So transparency is when you impose to a company obligation to publish several information. When you regulate with data, it means that the information is passing through the regulator. And the regulator is uh, making several choices about what kind of data are of more or less interest. The regulator can aggregate the data and then republish uh, the data under uh, several formats. So I give you uh, 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 several examples. So in France, we have, um, we have been uh, publishing data about coverage maps of mobile uh, operators. So many regulators are doing this. Um, and so we have mandated the operator 
to give us the, 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 the coverage data with very, uh, uh, so it's not a binary information like coverage or not coverage. We have imposed several levels of quality. So it's uh, not coverage, limited coverage, uh, uh, normal coverage, and good coverage. And then we publish, so we aggregate this data. This data is given by the operators to RCEP. We are verifying the information. So we are making drive tests. You know, we send cars uh, on all the roads of France to verify the information. This is paid by the, the, the operators. It's, it's quite expensive, but we are choosing the, the audit company and we are writing the, all the rules of the audit, uh, of the, the, the control. And then we publish the information in open data about the network coverage. But actually, this is not enough. Because to make this data really meaningful for people, you have to, 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 to fulfill the gap between the complex information we publish and the real experience of people. To do that, we are working under the form of partnerships with several um, startups, applications that provide this service. So I give you the example of one company. The company is uh, Cosby. Uh, it's, it's a French company. Uh, so this company, they install on your mobile a tracker that is follow, so it's full uh, GDPR compliant, of course. So you install a, a, a tracker that is following you during uh, one week. And thanks to that, they can issue, uh, you can see it, a, co a coverage map of your point of presence. So you can see on my, on, on my mobile, this is my coverage map in Paris. So this is the places I, I'm, I, 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 I sleep, I live, I work, the transport I, I'm, I'm, I'm taking. And then, thanks to this information, I, I will not do it here because uh, we are in Germany, you can, you can launch um, a, a, a system that will issue a ranking of the operator that is linked to your personal map. So it means that the information you will get is not only what's the best operator on a national average in France, it will tell you which is the best operator for you. And it's not always the same. It's not always the same. So, uh, for instance, I made, it, I made a test a few minutes ago about which is the best operator um, here in the place. So you can see, uh, you, have, you have the ranking of the, the German operators in, the, in this hotel, for instance. But I'm sure that if you are uh, uh, trying in another hotel, in another place, it will not be T-Mobile. Maybe it will be Vodafone or O2. So thanks to this tailor-made information, you really bring to the people a relevant information. And then you can influence the market. Because now, telecom companies in France are not only competing on prices. Of course, prices are very important. And we have low prices in France, and we are happy with it. But they are also competing about coverage and quality. So during this summer, one telecom company in France have advertised about the fact that they were the best company in rural areas in terms of quality of the internet. So this is typically the kind of uh, um, uh, data-driven regulation or re program of regulating with the data we can, we can implement. Another example, uh, a classical example, is in the financial sector. So in the financial sector, you know there are systemic banks where the regulator is um, accessing to data in real time about what is happening to the company. They can detect weak signal uh, and, and, and then uh, mandate several uh, behavior to the companies if there are problems. Uh, and generally speaking, they can gather data and gen then use big ta data algorithm to, to, to look at the data and detect uh, possible problems. So this is typically the way regulators can use the, the data. We have in France uh, a law that is under discussion about the new mobilities. And this law will empower our transport regulator colleague to, uh, uh, to um, uh, mandate the transport company to share the data uh, between each other. So this will be a very interesting example. We will see how it works. Um, so today it's a little bit early. And the, the scope of what is a transport company, of course, has to be discussed. For example, is Waze a transport company? 
Uh, this, this is a big question. Uh, what I find interesting in this law, if it's passed, of course, is that in the end, it will be in the hand of the regulator to decide what is uh, reasonable to share and possibly at which uh, uh, economic conditions, because it's not necessary for free. So it will be a case-by-case -case approach. And thanks to that, we can hope to build progressively a kind of jurisprudence of uh, what are the, 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 the good balance between the, the economic interest of the companies that have gathered the data, but still the necessity to share this data for, for public interest. So um, thank you for your attention, and uh, I'm, I'm happy to, to answer possible questions later. Thanks a lot, Sebastian. Now to uh, our last uh, intervention by uh, Francesca Bria. Thank you, last but not least. So yes, first of all, <laughs> uh, it's great to be here. Thanks for coming to the workshop. Um, I'm going to actually, uh, in this workshop, be representing, I'm a now, uh, I've been four years the Chief Technology and Digital Innovation Officer of the City of Barcelona, uh, but I now work as a Senior Digital Advisor for the UN Habitat, which is the body of the UN that deals with um, cities. And um, the UN has been promoting a big coalition uh, where they are now part of over 60 cities, which is the Cities Coalition for Digital Rights, which are implementing novel approach to data sovereignty and to the smart city. And so I, I'm um, now working in this new capacity. And I also lead the Decode project, which is a, a European Commission uh, funded project, one of the flagship projects to experiment uh, data sovereignty for citizens in Europe. So I will discuss um, the importance actually to, if in a moment where I think is very, very critical, when Europe is proposing to lead the way when it comes to digital sovereignty and data sovereignty for citizens and to privacy as, as a comprehensive approach for the digital economy of the future. I think the role of cities are critical because cities are um, on the ground, very close to citizens, regra regaining democratic uh, trust and enabling citizen empowerment and citizen participation. And cities can also prototype practical approaches, so move from uh, large, like high-level regulation and policy proposals to experimenting practical approaches, uh, scale it up, see what works and what doesn't, and very importantly, involving and engaging citizens in the process, which I think it's a matter of democracy, but also it enables us to show that when we are talking about data in a digital society or in a smart city, we're really talking about access to fundamental services, healthcare, education, transportation, since we are digitalizing the core of our public and urban infrastructures, the access to data and connectivity and artificial intelligence really means access to city services and to fundamental um, services and infrastructure for citizens. So we have to put at the very core cooperative approaches to solving really important problems and urban challenges uh, like sustainable mobility, the fight against climate change and for a green city, better education, better housing, all these big challenges are going to uh, require that we are able to mobilize collective resources, which I think data is a very important one. And we have to, as policymakers, enable to see data as a, as, a, as a very important collective resource that can generate public value, not only private profit for very few players. So I will share um, some of the experiments that we've been running in Barcelona for the last four years and uh, tell you how I think these approaches can be scaled at European level, but also hopefully globally. So we've been implementing a model that has become a bit of a reference for other cities globally. And we declare that data produced by citizens belong to citizens. So I think we all know that there is a key battleground at the moment in the digital economy is the control over data, which is the raw material of the digital economy. It fuels artificial intelligence and unfortunately is controlled by very few uh, companies globally. So we have been betting on a new model, which is 
will data be controlled by big businesses, by the state, or by citizens? And we declared that data produced by citizens belong to citizens, so that the immense economic value that such data represents is returned back to citizens. In order to do that, we had to change um, the old deals between city halls and the public um, and the private sector partners. So this word of public procurement, which is not very sexy but very important for governments, uh, became at the core of some of our reforms. So we have introduced data sovereignty clauses in public procurement contracts in a way that any supplier that works for the city of Barcelona must give back the data that they gather to deliver services to the city in machine-readable format. This data then becomes a public infrastructure, like electricity, water, roads, and the clean air we breathe. Uh, on, of course, we are also putting ethics, privacy, and security by design at the very core of how we develop these services. Ethics and security has to be delivered by default to the citizen, which means has to be embedded into technology infrastructure. On top of that, we develop a blockchain and uh, like a distributed ledger infrastructure, a new cryptographic protocol that enables citizens to decide what data they want to keep private, what data they want to share, with whom, and on what terms. And we've done this through the Decode project, and encryption should be considered a human right in the digital society. So also before we talked about homomorphic encryption or attribute-based cryptography. This is not, I mean, it is high science, I have to say, but this is widespread. I mean, this is not technologies that only big companies have. Uh, in the European Union, we found through Horizon 2020, which is our big research and innovation program, a lot of these projects, research institutions, and you know, we have some of the best privacy and cryptography researchers in the world, which are producing this technology that can be used and deployed. In fact, now Barcelona and Amsterdam are developing this infrastructure. We have 14 partners that are using these tools, and they can be scaled. Uh, this decode uh, privacy enhancing data infrastructure links to very basic services in the city of Barcelona. It links to our citizen participatory platform. It was used by 400,000 citizens to co-create the policy of the city of Barcelona. And today, 70% of the action plan that the city of Barcelona is implementing came directly from citizens using this uh, participatory digital platform. The fact that this platform is built with open source, it has data portability, it is privacy enhancing and decentralized, enable us to create civic alternatives of the likes of Facebook, which are platform, I mean, we saw with Cambridge Analytica, that favor the manipulation and commercial exploitation of personal information and data. So our attempt was to move away from that model and declare you know, data as a fundamental right to citizens and their privacy being really uh, protected by the type of uh, um, infrastructure we use. We also been experimenting this approach uh, with IoT platforms. So Barcelona has an Internet of Things platform, very pervasive, which runs on top of a 700 kilometers of public fiber. So this is very good. It enables us to monitor um, you know, the water management, uh, mobility and transportation, the lighting to make it more sustainable and efficient, fight climate change because we can see how much CO2 emission we consume. So maybe we're moving from uh, like regulating with data to making effective public policies with data that can really serve the interests of citizens. So uh, with the Decode project, we enable citizens to share sensor data. <laughs> Honestly, they were putting the sensor kit in their home to measure CO2 pollution or noise, but they could share this data securely. And they can decide with whom they want to share this data. Maybe they want to share with data with the city hall or with their community, but they don't want this data to end up with advertisers or with an insurance company. So this really enabled data sharing at large scale, but also protecting the fundamental rights of citizens. 
So I think that this model can be implemented at the EU level while creating a strong competitive environment at the service level, regulating data access and imposing data sharing mandates for over the top players. So I'm very interested to see where the French law will go because this enables better regulation but also better competition. And, uh, and this will also promote the sharing of anonymized data and algorithms so that cities can create open and shared services with that data that can be used by European SMEs, public administrations, and nonprofits. And now, uh, in my role with the United um, Nations um, Habitat uh, program, where we are trying to pilot a new framework program to promote smart cities and inclusive digital cities around the world, we can take these principles of the Cities Coalition for Digital Rights uh, that basically support fundamental rights of citizens, the right to privacy, information self-determination, to anonymity, but also large-scale sharing of data for public purpose, we could scale it and, um, and prototype it um, so that it can work for all citizens and so that digitalization become really a core of future public policies. And I think just uh, my last remark would be that public contracting rules reform could really facilitate to introduce some of these changes in public procurement processes and enable, create capacity building also for the public sector uh, workers because, of course, any digital transformation, it's not about technology, it's about cultural change, it's about capacity building, and it's about organizational transformation. So obviously we're going to have to invest a lot in education and in understanding that these different approaches can really work for the many, so that we have digitalization that serves the purpose of improving our cities, creating better services, and, and improving the life of citizens. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Francesca, for this uh, both concrete and uh, principle-based uh, uh, presentation. Uh, so uh, now uh, uh, the floor is yours for any questions uh, you have. Uh, we take 10 minutes for the questions, and then I will make a, a short uh, wrap-up and uh, conclusion. Thanks a lot for those insights. Uh, I think what we heard from Barcelona um, was pretty delighting. Um, would you please like to elaborate a bit uh, how we could transfer that more on a European level and how that complies with uh, GDPR and what could be changed in the next GDPR revision uh, to foster this change in this public direction? Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Uh, uh, we take just a few questions and then we answer. Other questions? Yes? Thank you. Um, my question is more for the regulators. Um, my name is Lucas. I'm working with a social business working on in 30 countries with mobile telecom operators, mostly in Africa and Asia. And I've, sitting, I've been sitting with a lot of regulators and I had to explain to them what is a SIP, what is an E1, and, and how is the technology working. So the question is for you, what do you think is needed to enable regulators, not only in France, um, but in developing countries where a lot of data mining is going on right now, to actually live up to that standard and live up to that vision that, that you both had shared, um, and to eventually turn data into a public good and not a neo-colonial commodity. Okay, and uh, a third question? Yes, hello. I have a question for Frances and also for the regulator regarding transport operator data. So um, I understand that uh, you would impose uh, regulating such data by private uh, transport operator because they are operating in the city, which is like a, a common shared space. Uh, how do you deal with the arguments of the private operators? Uh, what is the incentive? Is there, are there economic incentives or any other forms of... Uh, of ways to convince them that actually data sharing is good for everyone in the city. Thanks. Okay. Uh, so maybe uh, Francesca and then uh, Sh Sheriff and uh, Sebastian. Yes. So the first one about the European approach and, uh, and GDPR. 
So I, I really believe that the question around GDPR is enforcing GDPR in an effective way. So GDPR is a huge step forward to uh, understand, you know, our rights to data and people's rights in the digital society. The problem is how we are implementing it. So projects like Decode create infrastructures that are able to enforce the GDPR. So we are working with creating, you know, this centralized privacy announcing and cryptographic technology that enables citizens to exercise their rights in the digital world. So these, these tools need to be created. So this is part also of investment, which I think it has to be public investment, but also private investment into these next generation technologies that are gonna be privacy enhancing and rights preserving. And uh, the European Commission is presenting here the next generation internet program that goes in that direction. And there are a lot of initiatives and a lot of talent, for instance, around building blockchains or distributed ledger technologies that could be used for the purpose of creating more rights. So basically, to answer it to you, I think uh, scaling what cities are already demonstrating and testing at the European level, but understanding that this data sovereignty cannot be just one centralized big data lake governed by the states. I mean, this has to be people first, it has to empower citizens, and it has to decentralize the data economy to create more opportunity and to protect citizen rights. So it's a new approach that can be scaled prototype around the world where cities, because they are closer to the citizens, are very, very important. Uh, then to the transport um, uh, question. Well, this is very interesting. So uh, I think now here we have to be experimented with many different things because nobody knows what will work and uh, what doesn't work. So again, I think experimentation is really a good uh, way forward. So the approach of Barcelona uh, up to now has been working a lot with public procurement. And I think it's very effective, but it doesn't cover the entire issues. So public procurement, I mean, you know how much government spend in public procurement? A lot. It's a, it's a really big majority of how we spend our budget. So obviously, if you start implementing those rules in the public procurement process, this starts aligning a lot of operators, and then you start internally to the public operators, to as, as the French regulator is doing, to basically see how they can share data, data interoperability, data portability, but also giving back the data so that it becomes a public, a, a public infrastructure. Uh, I mean, as an effect of this policy, Barcelona now has a team, which is a, a data office with 40 people, with a chief data scientist, and you know they're working on machine learning, artificial intelligence, to use data for better policies and better services. So I think it's working very well. Just one quick point, I think a big challenge for cities is using data for regulating platforms. Because as you see, this should, shouldn't be a city problem. This should be maybe at national level or at European level, but the cities have been the one most impacted by the platform economy. I mean, Uber and Airbnb had massive impact on housing, I mean, affordable housing, but also on transportation of the main cities in the world. So what cities have done is they joined forces, so Barcelona is promoting the Sharing Cities Coalition, which have been discussed at the Smart City Expo this month, and these cities are sharing approaches to how to deal with this, because if we can't access the data of the platform, we cannot regulate it. So it is really very important to see what's in and what's out the black box algorithms, because how can you do meaningful regulation and meaningful policies if you don't know what the problem is? So it is a matter of understanding and you know, the access to data, I think it can favor much better policies and better regulations. Thanks a lot. Uh, Sebastian and uh, Shedev, do you want to add a few points? Uh, thank you. I want to add this one point for uh, regulation for uh, developing uh, countries. I would like to say that uh, uh, for developing uh, countries, uh, there is a need of international cooperation also because uh, many companies from uh, Europe or America are manipulating data from developing countries without any legal framework, without uh, some ethical or deontological uh, point to take into account. And so uh, in this way, I think, uh, African Union organization uh, could help to raise this question and uh, to have 
a good cooperation with uh, European uh, countries and the uh, uh, Council of Europe. Thank you. Okay. Yes, I, I fully agree. And regarding the question of um, empowering the regulators of developing countries, um, so we, are, um, we, we, we have a, a network of French-speaking regulators. Uh, the name of the network is uh, Fratel. Okay? Uh, so we have a website, fratel.org. Uh, and we have issued, uh, so I was the, the chairman of this, this network this year, and we have issued a complete report about how to use the data as um, um, a telecom regulator. Uh, today, uh, what we see in developing countries is that actually regulators have a very extensive access to data of the operators. But often, they, they, they are not publishing it in um, a, a way that, is, uh, um, that, that makes sense for people. So they are publishing to make it simple Excel uh, sheets whether it would make sense to publish uh, coverage maps, for instance. So we are providing tools to, 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 to accompany our colleagues, uh, and we are in discussion with the, the French Development Bank and also the World Bank uh, about uh, uh, making this information more available and to, to, to accompany interested parties. But uh, yes, that, that, that's an important topic, and I'm happy to have any partners interested in, in this room to, uh, to continue to spread the, these good practices. And uh, to, to, regarding the question of uh, what is the interest of private companies to share data, my point of view of regulator, if they are interested to, to, to share data, data, maybe it's not the most interesting data. <laughs> so I think, yeah, so I think you need a regulator in the room and you, you need to mandate the data sharing. So that, that is where I see a, comp um, uh, a complement approach between, for instance, municipalities and regulators. Municipalities, they need the data, but they don't have necessarily the legal regime to access to the data. Uh, so maybe having a regulator that can be uh, uh, um, uh, used, let's say, by the municipality to access to the data of the private company, maybe it's, uh, it's the good complement, uh, uh, complementary action. But, but clearly, we are talking about uh, regulation and mandating access to, 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 to the data. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, I, I will have to conclude. Uh, and it is important to uh, um, make a, a synthesis about uh, all has, that has been said. So, we have seen, uh, as we could guess, a variety of goals we, which show, who shows the, the potential of uh, data sharing. It goes from uh, preventing the spreading of epidemics from uh, a new kind of uh, data-driven regulation. So it has a lot of potential. We have seen that there are a plurality of approaches, uh, uh, legal, regulatory, uh, contractual, uh, technical, using hardware or software uh, regulation. So uh, there is also this variety of tools. Uh, but uh, there is potential, but there are also uh, challenges and risks uh, to uh, achieve uh, data sharing, uh, you, have, you need to have a strategy, uh, uh, a clear uh, thought uh, strategy. Uh, there are costs uh, for and uh, uh, kind of uh, reluctance from uh, private companies, uh, in part from uh, uh, legitimate interest to uh, data sharing, so that, that you have to overcome. And there are risks, uh, of course, uh, especially about uh, sensitive uh, data and uh, respecting uh, privacy. So uh, we have explored a few uh, propositions. Um, so uh, there is, of course, uh, the need uh, to uh, eat the elephant uh, piece by piece. Uh, and uh, that, that means uh, also uh, to uh, experiment, uh, uh, advancing uh, step, uh, step by step. Um, the need uh, in governments to uh, get uh, uh, multi-stakeholders uh, approach. It's not only the state. There is a complementarity between the state, the cities, uh, and the citizen must, must uh, remain uh, at the center, uh, have the power about how 
his data is uh, shared uh, and it is important to implement uh, this privacy by designs in the technologies uh, used. And we have also uh, explored a few uh, uh, tools, uh, leverage, uh, like uh, uh, public uh, procurement, which can be uh, uh, very uh, powerful uh, to uh, uh, influence uh, uh, the, the data showing uh, behaviors, and also uh, the regulation who, who, who can uh, uh, change the way the competition is, uh, uh, is going on. So, this is a very quick uh, uh, synthesis, but uh, uh, I hope uh, it uh, gives uh, everyone uh, the, uh, the, the wish to go on working about this uh, important uh, issue. Thanks, everyone.